Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Snyder has spoken, written, and presented on the thesis that the central banks are led by highly credentialed, ham-fisted, incurious humans who present themselves as highly credentialed, apolitical economic scientists. That's why it's very strange that over the last several weeks, Mr. Snyder has found himself in complete agreement at the conclusions arrived at by the Federal Reserve. And that's why I believe sincerely that we may be witnessing the very final episode today. This might be it. As Snyder retires in happiness, professional success for having brought lightness to the darkness. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Boop. But first, friends, did you know that scientists know what poets do not? The earth will end in fire. Yes, with the expansion of the sun, it's inevitable that the earth will be burned to a fine vapor. How will you spend your next several billion years? May I suggest that you check out Jeff Snyder's recent writing at Real Clear Markets on the story of Xi Jinping's childhood. It was an absolutely fantastic essay, and we would normally go over it line by line and bring out the highlights, but the whole thing is a highlight. I thought it was fantastic, and I highly recommend it. And let me see. I guess I wasn't super prepared. Here's the title of it. The China of today seeks nothing but its own terms. July 2nd, 2021. Highly recommend it. Check it out. Well, let's go live now to the undisclosed location somewhere off the Atlantic seaboard. Jeff Snyder, head of global research. Welcome to the show. Welcome, Emil. Thank you very much. Fantastic introduction as always. I'm trying to uh, read commercials now, even if they're not real. Jeff, let's get down to business then. You don't feel comfortable agreeing with what the Federal Reserve has been saying, their conclusions recently. What are, what, what are the two conclusions that they've recently announced that you agree with? Well, I might feel comfortable agreeing with people like Jay Powell on very small things like, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and things like that. But when we agree on topics of inflation or even the reverse repo program, it makes me it makes my skin kind of crawl. You know, the spidey senses start tingling because by and large over the last many decades, I mean, five, six, seven decades, Federal Reserve, monetary topics, they don't usually get together in a very good way, and especially recently going back to, you know, 2007, 2008. The last thing you want to find yourself in to be in a comfortable, correct position is an agreement with any kind of central banker on the topic of money and economy. But here we are in 2021, the Federal Reserve's position on first inflation, this price deviation, price spikes, whatever you want to call it, what's going on recently. They believe that these are tran due to transitory factors. They won't last. Things will go back to normal. And as we talked about before, you know, a couple of weeks back, that was actually the position of Ben Bernanke in 2010 and 2011. Maybe people don't remember it that way, but that was the last time we had this level of inflation hysteria, money printing, all this other stuff that's coming home to roost. And what Bernanke said was, no, this is transitory. It'll go away. Now, we agreed with him then, as we agree with Powell today on inflation, but for vastly, vastly different reasons. So that's where we can at least be somewhat comfortable or somewhat okay in the fact that we're on the same side as the Fed, but not for the reasons the Fed thinks. And part of those reasoning goes to our second place where we agree, which is in this reverse repo stuff. Now the reverse repo has become a topic of conversation because people don't know why. It's a big number, something big must be happening, therefore I'm gonna look it up on the internet and see what some common definitions of it and try to piece together what's going on. Also because it went from zero to 60 like that, right? It wasn't gradual, it was a yeah, sudden shock. Yeah, big number shock. that showed up almost out of nowhere. And of course, you know, whenever that happens, Federal Reserve, money, all this other, what, you know, people's, people start to start, uh, start asking questions, what is going on here? And it's quite natural, it's quite, quite, quite positive. And what we have said from the very beginning is that no, it just, well, let's, first of all, the common, the common definition, if you look up reverse repo in Investopedia, as I always say, is what you'll see is that this is a method for the Federal Reserve to soak up 
too much money or soak up reserves so that they can control short-term money rates. That's the textbook definition. That's the textbook use. In fact, the Federal Reserve actually used this reverse repo in 2008 during the crisis to accomplish that task, which tells you a lot about what went on in 2008, why they got it so wrong. But we're not going to go over that today because we've covered that many times before. So the idea in 2021 is super QE, TGA being drawn down as the government refunds bills and you know starts spending this quote unquote stimulus. We've got a flood of money hitting the markets, reducing uh, interest, short-term interest rates all across the board. And here's the reverse repo working as it's supposed to, soaking up reserves, keeping money rates from going, going haywire and some of them going negative. Although it should be pointed out, some of them did go negative in the repo market. But by and large, the idea is there's too much money, reverse repo soaking up, it's all working very well. And what we said from the very beginning is no. There's another side of this. There's always another side of this when it comes to money. And that other side is collateral. And what we've said is, yes, there is a flood of reserves coming onto the system. And so that is definitely creating some demand for reverse repo usage. However, big part of it is the fact that there is a shortage of collateral, especially treasury bills. Part of it that's being created by the federal government, the Treasury Department's refunding of bills due to the debt ceiling. They've shut down several cash management bill lines, which is subtracted collateral from the system, as well as risk aversion that, that, that takes place, which contracts the overall collateral pool and herds people into the best of the best collateral too. So you have those two things happening simultaneously, which creates the problem of collateral scarcity, which the reverse repo, when you look at it from the perspective of cash lenders, is a solution to. It's not about too much money, it's about too little collateral. You can go to the Federal Reserve reverse repo window and it's like you're going into the repo market, except you're lending cash to the Fed and they're giving you back securities in, out of their SOMA, SOMA portfolio. So if you can't find a collateralized lending arrangement in the private market, if say you're a money, a cash rich money market fund, you can't find anybody with T-bills to do to a repo trade with you, go to the Fed. or in some instances, dealers can access the reverse repo if they're short of collateral for other means, just, just trying to get through the day to make it to tomorrow. So the reverse repo, in, uh, when we're looking at it, the other side of it of what's coming back is collateral. Not too much money, too little collateral. That's what we've said from the very beginning. And as Emil, I know you've pointed this out, I pointed it out too. It's not coincidence that we see anti-reflation and long-term bond yields start to, to materialize the exact, I mean, to the day that the reverse repo usage started to skyrocket. So people were piling at the reverse repo, anti-reflation and, and tre long-term treasury yields. Those two things are, are, you know, the one isn't causing the other. Those are two reactions to the same thing, which is collateral scarcity. Exactly, exactly. That's right. In previous episodes, we made the point, yes, I guess it could be. And you, you made the point, it is too much cash and there's a greater return. So Yeah, it doesn't have to be ahead. either or here. It could be both things simultaneously. But the timing, the timing of when this happened, February 24th, 25th, 26th, May 18th, coincided with bad things happening in the monetary system. Well, so we've said that. And apparently YouTube is not blocked at the Federal Reserve computers network, right? They apparently can go online and Mr. Jay Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, watches this show. And when he was questioned in front of Congress, what did he say? He said, Jeff Snyder is right. No, well, <laughs> no. it's between the lines, but he says, you could say there is a shortage of safe short assets. So yeah, that's why it's happening. There's a shortage of T-bills, not a lot of T-bills. Case closed. I'm going to shut down the internet now. This is the end of the episode, Jeff. But wait a minute. You say, hmm, we agree, but for very different reasons with vastly diverging views as to what it actually means. We know what you have stated. What does Jay Powell, who seems to be agreeing with you, what does he think this means? Well, first, I mean, his the response you just read was in was a, a response to a question from a, a you know Arkansas congressman who asked him specifically about 
too much money, reverse repo, maybe you should shut down QE, you're doing too much kind of a thing, especially since this previous question had been about the quote unquote housing bubble that's taking place. So you could say Jay Powell is just saying that to you know, sort of pass the buck to Janet Yellen because in, implied in his response is, oh, well, you know, the Treasury Department is shrinking the level of bills that are being issued and that's driving the reverse repo. Don't blame me and QE. It's not our fault, it's Janet Yellen's fault. But actually, in a funny way, he's actually not blaming Janet Yellen either. He's actually blaming the congressman who was asking him the question because Janet Yellen has to shrink bills due to Congress not acting on the debt ceiling. So you could make this all about politics and say, well, Jay Powell was just saying the most convenient thing that, that, that passed the buck to Janet Yellen and then back to Congress again, and that this reverse repo stuff is all really benign and it's really just this technicality in the bill market. However, again, as you and I, we just, you just talked about, there's mountains of evidence that you know, Jay Powell is not being disingenuous here. He's actually looking at the system as it is and saying, this is a deficiency and this is, the, this is what happened, you know, the cause and effect of a deficiency, lack of bills, for, forcing a lot of people to go into the reverse repo, and that's, that's a problem. Now, where, what is that I said, where Jay and I diverge is why that's a problem and what that actually means. To him, this is nothing more than sort of a monetary technicality, such as it was to Ben Bernanke's Fed in September and October of 2008, when they believed there was too much money back then too, despite the fact that the world had been melting down all over the place in every market, the Fed actually thought there was too much money, too much reserves that needed to be soaked up by this technical issue in the reverse repo. So in many ways, it's the kind of the same thing, if not to that level of trouble, Jay Powell is echoing Ben Bernanke and saying, we've got too many, too few bills. We'll clean it up using a reverse repo. We'll raise IOER by five basis points. No big deal. All of this stuff is just a big, you know, you know, stuff that we worry about that nobody else should. Of course, as we've said many times before, you don't let a collateral scarcity become anything worse than that because as time and time again, we've seen that's where the big problems show up. If we have a collateral issue, scarcity can quickly become shortage, which then spirals out of control. The word morphology means the study of the form and structure of things. Now, the very first time I ever came across that word was in 2016 while reading uh, The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe and William Strauss. And they were talking about the morphology of this cycle this four generation long cycle, the steps, the form, the structure of what you see for at least 500 years of Anglo-American history, you can see this echo. Well, what we're going to talk about is that, yeah, I guess it is just this technicality, except that it's part of a morphology. It's part of a structure. We see this, then this, then this. And as you just explained before I started talking, it leads to a severe acute dollar shortage, a crisis, one of the four yeah, that we've already... And absolutely. It's, you know, they want to look at this as a sort of a snapshot. This mm -hmm. is today. This is what's happening today. The numbers are big, but, the, you know, today is unrelated to tomorrow, which is unrelated to the day after that, which is unrelated to the day, before, you know, yesterday. That's the, you know, and it's a deeply embedded ideological problem with economics, going back to Poincaré and, every, you know, the idea that markets are detached and, you know, uh, uh, random walks and all these other things. But that's there's a tendency to look at these things as a snapshot. As you were just saying, Powell said, you know, yes, we have a <clears throat> excuse me. We have a problem in Treasury bills. We don't have enough Treasury bills. But so what? That's today. It's it's we're we're handling it. We're working on it. When as you're as you're about to do, I think <laughs> putting together that. No, this is in a this is another signpost in a you know walking down a specific path or a specific, going down a specific road that we have seen repeat time and time and time again and knowing what we do about the importance of collateral the repo market and derivatives because collateral goes also applies to the derivatives markets and currency markets and all sorts of other things that you know collateral scarcity is not a specific snapshot it's an underlying condition that that permeates pretty much the entire history going back to Bear Stearns and, and before. So I've pulled up a graph from 2009 through 2012, and we're going to go through a couple of these examples that show an event and then a landmine. What is the event and what is the, the landmine? What does that mean? 
that usually there's been specific days, you know, snapshots where we see the treasury market seemingly go haywire, where yields will fall in a single day by double digit basis points, which is so contrary to the dominant narrative or the mainstream narrative that, you know, hey, look, the world is recovering, things are going great, inflation is about to get, get high and out of control. So the last thing you would expect is a day where, where double digit decreases in yields, not just in the US treasury market, but all across the world, because those two things are so hugely inconsistent, almost a buying panic in safe instruments that just doesn't make sense to the mainstream view of you know, inflation recovery, QE, abundant reserves, too much money, all of these things, when you see essentially a scramble for liquidity. And so that day that happens it was May 6th of 2010, which was overshadowed by the flash crash in uh, you know, the stock, US stock market in particular, but that was a repo event and you could see it coming. There were warning signs beforehand and when the liquidity got sucked out of the repo system because of this collateral problem on that day, particular day, May 6th, it wasn't a snapshot of you know, technicality. It was a warning that these things were, that the problem underlying was getting worse to the point that something snapped in the system that hurted the entire global marketplace in terms of collateral into those best forms of collateral. And of course it happened again a year later after QE2 on March 16th. Again, we had the, you know, March, 6, March of 2011, if you recall, was a lot like it is today where, you know, inflation was, his, inflation hysteria was out of control. People thought money printing, QE2, it's definitely coming home to roost. You're gonna see, you know, high levels of CPI growth. All these, all these things are happening in early 2011. And then here we have this day on May, March 16th, where again, treasury yields, bond yields fell by double digits, which everybody said, oh, snapshot is a technicality. It's about the Japanese tsunami and earthquake and Fukushima and all these bad things. That's all it is. And yet a couple months later, we get what we call the landmine, which is when it's almost like a, a gravity or a downdraft. The bond yields don't just fall in a single day or they don't just fall at a regular pace. They fall quickly for months and they drop quite a, you know, quite a distance in a short period of time, which is sort of the final warning that this dollar shortage problem, collateral problem that's driving the dollar shortage has reached such an extent it's probably past the point of no return. So that's really what the landmine signifies is that this accumulation of warnings, which this you know, collateral day is one of the most, uh, most stark warnings up until that, by the time you get to the landmine, that's pretty much the signal that no nope, inflation's done. They never really had much of a chance to begin with, but now it's zero, and we're going back into a deflationary circumstance. August 9th, two thousand seven. May six, twenty ten. March sixteenth, twenty eleven. October fifteenth, twenty fourteen. That's where we're going to turn to next. Jeff, quick one though. We've talked about November twentieth, twenty. November twentieth, twenty thirteen indirectly when we were talking about mortgage-backed securities and the taper tantrum and then you have a whole essay at real clear markets to this day the world still thinks it was about qe july 9th 2021 folks check that out would we include november 20th 2013 in this list of single day events followed by disorder that would then lead to something worse or no. November 20th to me was about collateral, but on the mortgage side, so it's sort of more specific. And so I put that not as one of these collateral days, but as one of those warning signs. Okay. An early warning sign that, you know, in, in the late 2013, again, inflation, the mainstream narrative, here was something that happened that was completely contrary to that. But I don't think it was as, as I don't, I wouldn't put it in the same category as March 16th, 2010. And certainly not as October 15th, 2014, which is probably the granddaddy of them all. Because if you remember October 15th, 2014, what happened on that day and the early morning training, trading, which I think we're going to talk about early morning repo next week. But anyway, in early morning trading, you had just an utter collapse in interest rates. And again, October of 2014, everybody was super positive. The economy was overheating, best jobs market in decades. And here you see bond yields tank in a single day. I think uh, the 10 year dropped 23 basis points high to low, which is an enormous single day move. And everybody, I'm completely confused. What, what the hell's going on here? I mean, this, 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 this can't happen. The economy's overheating, not, not you know, sinking back into something like 2008, which is what that kind of a move indicated. 
And what it was was, again, as we said, the collateral position becoming so so untenable that it just snapped. Everybody was herded into out of some other you know riskier forms of collateral and into on a single day the most pristine forms of collateral they could get their hands on as fast as they could get their hands on before it led to more dire consequences on an individual case, uh, individual case level. So October 15, 2014 was a big one that said, forget inflation, forget the jobs market, forget overheating. This is a severe warning in the monetary system that says deflationary pressures, particularly in the collateral side of things, are building up such to the point that they're becoming untenable. And only, I mean, it wasn't even two months later that we got the 2014 landmine beginning in December of 2014, lasting all the way into February. It was a huge downdraft and again, perplexing to the mainstream narrative. Of why are bond yields falling? Why are inflation expectations falling when we believe everything's going correctly? It's because they missed the, the, these intricacies and details of how, first of all, what collateral, what's going on in collateral, but how important that really is. Perhaps we are assuming that people know this, but each of these dates that we m mention, it doesn't remain within just the monetary order. This then spills over into capital markets, into society yeah. and the real economy. So we've got a collateral shock, landmine, and soon enough, the economy, the real economy is in trouble, which is what's most important. So it's... That's, I, I, we just you know, want to I underline that. I think that's why that. most people don't know these dates is because, I mean, they should, everybody should, these dates should be burned into everybody's memory. And the reason they're not, they're, they aren't, is again, because people don't understand collateral, but you know, the mainstream media doesn't understand this stuff either. Everybody, every story you see written about October 15, 2014 says the same thing. Oh, it was a computer trading problem in treasury because that's the explanation, the benign sounding explanation that authorities came up with because it couldn't possibly be deflationary forces, right? Janet Yellen, QE, overheating, all this positive positivity in the economy. It couldn't possibly be what it was because that's so, it's exactly the opposite case of what everybody was supposed to believe. And so time and time again, you know, March 16, 2011, oh, Japan, Fukushima, it can't possibly be deflationary when two months later, we go into another crisis. I mean, all of these things happen in a, in a very specific way, you could see them happening. You could tell they were happening as they happen, as they happen. But if you're, you know, just a your regular Joe on the street, you can understand why none of this stuff has ever entered their consciousness because it's it, it's so, it's first of all misunderstood, but then it's completely rewritten as something that it's not. People may be saying we're picking on Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, but no, we're well, they deserve opportunity. <laughs> they deserve it. They well, earned that. We're not going to leave Jay Powell out of it because Jay Powell came into power February 2018 with the wind at his back of globally synchronized growth. Janet Yellen handed him a booming economy with inflation rising. I don't remember, but unemployment was low. Stocks rising, were high. Inflation was ready. It was all right there. We were on the cusp. May 29th, 2018. And again, what was May 29th? Same thing. Same exact thing. You had early morning trading. Uh, safe bond, you know, sovereign debt markets, Germany, U.S., JGBs, uh, especially in the U.S. And, and German markets, interest rates fall significantly, and the media fills up with stories about the Italian finance minister or something going on over in Italy. I mean, some ridiculous thing that had absolutely nothing to do with it. And really, as you know, as we I think we talked about in the last episode of Meal, early 2018. You know, before Jay Powell ever steps into the uh, to, into the, his office as chairman of the Federal Reserve, there was warning signs that things were going bad back then. So we have the same pattern repeat. We have these smallish warning signs build up, build up, build up, and then all of a sudden, bam! There's a collateral day that shows up that says something became untenable, something changed, it broke. In fact, you go back to May 29th, you see that across all these you know bond market charts, you know inflation expectations. For that cycle, when did they peak? May 29th. And then a couple of weeks later, Euro dollar, cur Euro dollar futures inversion. And then within a few months, we have the next landmine that made it absolutely clear inflation story was wrong the entire time. Deflation is back again. So it, it's really, as you said, as you said at the beginning, there's a pattern here. It's a, it's a defined pattern that repeats time and time again largely because these are the same problems that never get fixed. And the reason they never get fixed is because 
the world has been told a story about money and QE and bank reserves that just is not a legitimate story. It Jeff, isn't what happens. Earlier I asked you about November 20th, 2013, and you said that it was uh, a warning, not exactly fitting the morphology here. Would September 17th, 2019, or February 25th, 2021, qualify as fitting our morphology? Do either of them qualify? Well, the repo rumble in September of 2019, I think, fits, but as after the land, it is one of the, hey, we're seeing consequences of things going wrong. The deflationary pressures have arrived. They're obvious to anybody who's not captured by the mainstream economic ideology. And so the, re the repo problems in September 2019 were just, here it is. Big problems are here. So it's, it's not a warning sign that things are coming. It was a signpost that, that okay, post landmine, here it is. Now, when we look at uh, February 24th, 25th of 2021, which Fedwire, bad, bad treasury auction, actually a blowout in interest rates. So it wasn't a collateral thing. It was a lack of dealer capacities to participate in the seven year bond auction that was offered that day because they were shut down by Fedwire and started, you know, in the back rooms trying to clear up all those transactions that that clogged the system for a couple hours there. That was simply a warning. It was one of those things that, OK, this, you know, abundant reserves, trillion, huge QEs, and yet we still have the same problems when dealers step back, markets get illiquid real, real fast. And that's really the money problem we're dealing with here, whether it's collateral or just you know derivatives or something else, when the dealer system, which is what creates the money in this Euro dollar system, when dealers step back, as we did in September of 2019, and in, in a narrow case in February of 2021, bad things happen and it doesn't matter what the federal reserve has done or is doing it just that that was a reminder that the system remains in that fragile condition where if anything shocks the dealer system forget it it's 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 a bad day for everybody and that's not how markets need to that's that's not something that markets are are, are need in order to to function properly in an dependable fashion markets need to be not worrying about liquidity they need to be worried about you know forward risks and things like that you know investment opportunities versus you know credit risk not whether or not tomorrow morning the repo market's going to be completely illiquid because dealers woke up on the wrong side of the bed that's the last thing you want to be focused on and it's a deflationary reminder that the system is that fragile jeff in our next episode we're going to talk about another signpost on the road to monetary socioeconomic hades and that's China lowering its RRP, which we'll talk about. What is it? RRR. You're thinking about Jay Powell and the RRP, <laughs> which I do all oh, the, the time. The shame, the shame. Too many, there's too many initials, you know, initialism. Alphabets, acronyms. China's done something to them. They've done it before. What happens next? We're going to talk about it right after this.